living with wildfire. It's a fact of life here in the Blue Mountains and in much of the Intermountain West. Do we control it or does it control us? Well, thanks for joining us. Today we'll be examining the issue of wildfire in the Blue Mountains. We've invited several distinguished experts in the field to help us understand the issue in greater detail and to provide several different points of view. But first, some background. Wildfire has shaped the forest here in the Blue Mountains more than any other single factor. How does it benefit us? Can we control it or even manage it? Today we're going to examine how to live in a landscape dominated by wildfire. We'll describe the natural fire regime of the Blue Mountains, how we as humans have changed things, and offer some solutions to a growing problem. In times past, fire was a frequent visitor to the Blue Mountains of Eastern Oregon and Washington. The area is dry and has frequent lightning storms that often ignite wildfires. Consequently, current plant communities are dominated by species that are resistant to fire or even dependent on fire for seed germination, for example. Much of the pre-settlement landscape was dominated by ponderosa pine, a species that thrives on relatively dry sites and has thick bark that's resistant to fires. Studies of old fire scars and stumps and in living trees indicates that much of the Blue Mountains was formerly characterized by low-intensity fires that thinned stands of ponderosa pine and other fire-resistant species, discouraged fir species, and kept fuels from accumulating. With the coming of settlers, the pressure to harvest trees for lumber at the greatest dollar return and to prevent loss of trees to wildfire changed the ecosystem dynamic. With the exclusion of fire, firs have come to dominate many sites once occupied by ponderosa pine. Thickets of these firs, killed by water stress, <coughs> insects, or disease, has led to the accumulation of dangerous levels of fuels for wildfires. The result is conditions that are ripe for fires of much greater size and intensity than were routine just 100 years ago. To help us explore how fire affects us here in the Blue Mountains and how we can best live with it, we've invited four experts in the field. John Zamoniak is assistant fire staff and air and fuels with the Willow Whitman National Forest. Berta Udy is Northeast Oregon Regional Ecologist with the Nature Conservancy here in La Grande. And Tom Goodall is assistant Timberlands manager for Boise Cascade Corporation, also here in La Grande. And John Buckman is Pendleton Unit Forester for the Oregon Department of Forestry. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. John Zamoniak, describe for us some of the recent fires that have received headlines in the Blue Mountains. Well, it, the, uh, the most recent experience that we've had with large fires were, of course, in 1996 with the, the more localized summit and tower fires that uh, burned large tracts of ground. They were very destructive wildfires and uh, covered a, a great number of acres. And uh, they, uh, because of the landscape continuity of the fuels that were in the area and the lack of disturbance over the past. There were, there were very heavy fuel loadings. The crown canopies were uh, conducive to supporting a large crown fire, which then moved across that landscape and frankly became very dangerous. It was uh, the most important thing we could do once it became a large fire was to get people out of the way until the weather changed to where we could have some effect trying to stop the fire. And, and what's the result on the landscape? when a fire like the tower fire goes through? When a, when a tower type of fire, a summit fire, some of these larger destructive type fires move through, there's a, there's a whole range, a suite of, of changes that take place in the landscape. Um, some of them, of course, could be perceived as beneficial and some not. If you're in an area that's more backcountry such as that or wilderness, um, the negative effects uh, from our standpoint are the the potential loss of soil nutrients because so much of it's volatilized when it burns so intensely. And you can also develop a water repellent soil that, that repels water over time. And really in, in a fire that, that covers 50,000 acres, you now reset the clock to zero over a large patch of ground instead of maybe areas that were 5,000 or 2,000 or 500 acres. It's a large area that now is all going to be the same. And it, it's like as not as to continue the boom and bust cycle up there. So, but haven't fires like this always occurred? Certainly, certainly. Fires have, have burned uh, for as long as there's been vegetation to, 
to consume by fire. The, the, probably the primary difference now would be where we have conditions that, that fires of such intensity can cover so much ground so fast. Um, that may be the difference, but even historically, say two or 3,000 years ago, any of these things could have been possible during uh, many ice ages, those types of things. But our fear is when they get that large is the risk to private property, the risk to the firefighters, and the, the damaging effects that, that people live in the area perceive this as, as not a good thing, and the amount of money that it takes to suppress these kinds of fires. Can we manage our way out of this? In certain situations, it's certainly possible to try to manage our way out of it, um, or at least begin to, to understand what needs to take place on the landscape. Um, the federal lands is, is just a, a mosaic of different uh, administrative types of restrictions and or opportunities. In wilderness areas, they're managed for a primitive experience. We're certainly not able to, nor do we want to go in and log those sorts of things. Or to manage the canopy, there are different opportunities there. Versus somewhere here in, say, in the foothills of Legrand or Baker District, where we're down in a more uh, managed situation where we have opportunities to extract some of these sorts of things, to get as much of a benefit out of it uh, as society can stand at, at any given spot, as well as to reduce the impacts from prescribed fire, uh, lower intensities when we lower the fuel loadings by taking it out, our chances of success are higher, and I think the emissions we produce are lower because we've utilized some of this material, and we've been able to then deal with fire more on our human terms versus a, a roll of the dice when a lightning storm comes. So things like uh, mechanical thinning and removal and prescribed fires, those are tools that reduce the fuel loadings, and so therefore, at least theoretically, reduce the intensity of wildfires when they come through. That's right. They, we're never going to completely stop fires. They, they, it, we have lightning, um, and the, uh, there are three components that certainly start fires. You have to have fuel, topography, and weather. Well, we know we can't do much about the weather. We're not going to change the topography, but we do have some opportunity to deal with fuels and fuel loading. So if we can utilize some of that material, move it, change it, or at least change some of the structural characteristics of how much of a landscape is in the same condition. The, and, and the thing we have to focus on is not just the fuels on the ground, but these large fires that become a crown fire that are so dangerous is the canopy level, the continuity of that vertical fuel. How much of it, uh, does it take a two foot flame to get to the crown or a 10 foot flame to get to the crown? And once it gets there, is there enough fuels in those crowns then to continue that, that energy flow across the landscape? So these techniques are, are meant to reduce the, the, um, that whole process of the fire proceeding up into the canopy and, and becoming a, a crown fire moving across the landscape. That's these, correct. These, the tools of thinning and prescribed fire. Right. Can, you, can you very briefly explain prescribed fire and what that is? Well, prescribed fire for, for us, um, as it's generally applied, we, when we ignite the fire, we do it under our terms with a, a burn plan we've developed. We've, we've written an EA that explained to the public. We've asked for their input about where we're going to burn, uh, when we might burn, and possible outfits, outcomes of that burning. But we'll get uh, both a smoke management forecast that, that talks about directions of the smoke, the potential for dispersal, and then we'll also get a weather forecast that'll talk to us about the types of, of weather we may expect both the day before the burn, the day of the burn, and ensuing days after, because once you light these larger burns off, you have to live with it for some days. And uh, uh, what you don't want is, is, is a big surprise out of the weather front. So it's humidity that's very important to us. We have to have the right humidity that controls the fine fuels. We need to know what the wind factors may or may not be. And, uh, and then that stability of the atmosphere, how much of the, the smoke is going to mix out for us. Are these prescribed fires always ground fires? Are they always prescribed to be ground fires creeping along the ground? Those are the times, those are the ones we're really focusing on right now, is that we've got a long a road with this program. And so to, to, to be successful, we need to treat the areas we'll be most successful with, which is a ground fire. We want our flame lengths to be somewhere in that two to four foot elevation, somewhere that, that we can control um, with, with small uh, strips that we ignite that move through, and then we'll light some more strips. I think that as a general rule in, in this part of the world, um, we're some years away from us talking about stand replacing type fires. I think that at, at some point someone may have to do that um, to talk about these higher elevation stands that, that really they only burn one way. And, and that's that, burn, that boom and bust, is that they burn very intensely when they do burn or they don't burn at all. 
um, and they're, they're, they're going to be a challenge for folks. And frankly, we, we, um, I don't think we're funded enough for that type of work. And uh, it just needs to be out there ways in the future for something to take care of. And it, it may, um, in, in these higher elevations, they may take care of themselves over time. And if we can treat enough of the areas that are adjacent to those things, we may lower the risk for those properties that are adjacent. So your prescribed fire program right now really only mimics a lower elevation ponderosa pine type that, it, that, that tended to experience these, these high frequency, low intensity fires. That's right. That's, that's where we think we're most out of balance in the sequence if we're talking about fire and fire effects. The low and mid elevation, say 5,000 feet and below, those are the stands that have gone the longest without a, a repeated um, small low intensity disturbance like fire to move and release the nutrients to generate and stimulate those organisms that are there that seem to respond with fire and have evolved with fire. Okay, let's talk just a little about smoke. Mm -hmm. uh, where there's fire, there's smoke. Uh, <laughs> what kind of smoke problems are presented when you're, uh, when you're using prescribed fire? And compare those to the, the kind we have with wildfires. The, uh, the prescribed fire smoke, as I mentioned earlier, we get a smoke management forecast where we try to, to um, determine which direction the column is going to go Where's that smoke going to end up, and how readily will it disperse? The, um, the difference is, of course, between wildfire and prescribed fire is a wildfire smoke, like in Tower or Summit, where you may loft a column 45 to 60,000 feet into the atmosphere. It'll go great distances. Um, it, we may put it into another state, in fact. The prescribed fire, uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, but prescribed fire is, is more of a local phenomenon it will impact the local communities, the valleys here. Because it's, it's of a lower intensity, we don't get the column to loft up and out into, say, Idaho or Montana, into someone else's neighborhood. Our solution is going to be local-based, and those folks that are going to have to, to tolerate and, and understand what we're doing is also local-based, and that, that smoke is uh, going to stay with us. Uh, as you said, there there's just is no silver bullet. When you have combustion, you make smoke. Uh, are there regulatory agencies you got to deal with with the smoke? Yes, we uh, we work very closely with with Oregon Department of Forestry and the smoke management forecast that we obtain daily uh, from Salem, and we also register all of our burns ahead of time. We we plan and know how much we're going to burn, when we're going to burn, so that they can factor that in across the landscape. So that if someone's burning in John Day, how will that may that affect someone in Legrand? If someone's burning over in in Ukiah, will that may possibly affect someone in Baker? And it's a fairly complex puzzle to try to match this up and then match it with the weather and the forecast to see what's it not only today, but what may it be three days from now. Uh, and now, when we compare the two different fuel reduction techniques, the prescribed fire that you've, you've just described and, uh, and the mechanical thinning and removal, mm -hmm. uh, how do you decide which method to use under which circumstances? Is this a, a simple decision? It's part art and part science. Um, it, it, it does involve uh, an interdisciplinary team, a team of biologists, wildlife biologists, fisheries biologists, and uh, foresters on the ground and fire specialists that look at, at different opportunities on a particular acre, what types of treatment may be most successful. And we also then have to balance in terms of is it managed for wilderness values, is it managed for backcountry, or is it around Phillips Lake that's high recreation density. Um, so you have to bend all that sort of thing in there, and then a line officer or manager has to make a decision that this is the best way to treat this today and, and deal with it from that perspective. Does the value of the stems that you want to remove have anything to do with it? Absolutely. I mean, you, you have to look at what the value and what the market is to, that, that, to try to take as much out and utilize it as, as possible. The other point with that is, is that because of the Clean Air Act and our, our agreement with the uh, Department of Environmental Quality here in the state of Oregon is we have... We've said that we'll use the best available control technology, just as any industry does in terms of trying to manage their emissions. And so that if we have the opportunity to try to utilize the biomass, the uh, Department of Environmental Quality would ask us to try to do that. Use what you can to reduce the emissions that may come and expose uh, the public in these communities to that kind of un the unhealthy effects of smoke. Okay. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. uh, let me turn uh, to you now, Mr. Mm -hmm. Buckman. Um, it's pretty clear that the, the federal agency's role uh, is, is to manage fuel and fires on federal lands. Uh, what's the role of Oregon Department of Forestry uh, regarding wildfires? Jim, the Oregon Department of Forestry is, is responsible 
for providing fire protection to about 16 million acres in Oregon. Uh, in Northeast Oregon, that's about 1.6 million acres. Uh, our customers, in general terms, are non-federal forest and, and rangeland owners within our protection districts. Uh, these, these landowners pay an assessment, an annual assessment, to the Department of Forestry to provide for fire protection. Uh, in simple terms, you could view our roles with wildfires, such as a local fire department inside a city. We are the fire protection for these forest landowners. So with that in mind, uh, our customers, these landowners, generally are adverse to the risk associated with fires. Uh, they also, in general terms, have a desire to make profits from their forest lands, forest and range lands. So, you know, it's the role or the mission of the Department of Forestry to effectively and efficiently suppress fires uh, that are destructive on private lands. Okay. So your, your, your major role with this issue is fire suppression? That's correct. Okay. Do you, um, uh, well, we heard that field reduction strategies are, are recognized as very important for management of the fire issue on federal lands. Do privately held lands have the same kind of fuels problem? Yeah. With a point that I just made, generally speaking, these non-federal landowners have a desire to make uh, profits from their lands. That can either be grazing or, in the case of forest lands, it can be with the uh, reclaiming assets from their lands. So with, with that in mind, most private lands have been intensively managed uh, for the last 20 or 30 years. In the early 90s, we had some very good uh, log prices and chip prices. That coincided with uh, quite a bit of mortality from some of the insect and diseases that, that visit our, our forests in northeast Oregon. Uh, many of these forest lands have been salvaged, so, so a lot of these, the fuels that if we could contrast it with the national forest system, uh, that are available there had been removed from the private lands. So okay. in general terms, we don't have the extensive uh, fuel loading problems that, that our neighbors do. W would these lands uh, in some way break up the, the, uh, the fuel sort of continuity on federal lands? Or they are, uh, what's the spatial distribution of those lands? And again, in general terms, uh, the non-federal lands tend to be lower elevation and from my perspective, they are not that well intermixed. Uh, they are more on the fringes of the forest. Uh, but so we aren't breaking up vast acreages of national forest lands. Okay, but let me ask you, maybe, a, maybe it's a rhetorical question yeah. at this point because uh, there isn't as big a fuel problem, but, but uh, what would be your average uh, landowner's response to uh, being offered these two different tools? Uh, would there, uh, do you have some of your customers that uh, are, would be supportive of prescribed fire? Our department with our various uh, employees has quite a bit of contact with non-federal landowners. You know, we, w when we're asked this question in the field, we, we first go ask the landowner what are their objectives. A and they say, you know, they, they can be uh, a whole variety of objectives. We have state fish and wildlife uh, uh, management areas. You know, their objectives are certainly going to be different than some industrial landowners or some of the uh, larger non-industrial landowners. Generally, they say they want a healthy forest. They want uh, viable, vigorous, healthy trees. They want a nice grass crop out there. We would go through some of the, the uh, items that John talked about, about how do we reach that objective. You know, I think we're going to talk about thinning and having a well-spaced forest. And we're going to look at mechanical means, or suggest mechanical means, that under the right log prices are revenue producing options as opposed to using some prescribed fire. You know, certainly uh, there are some landowners that do want to do some burning. Uh, it, from my perspective, uh, burning is not a panacea. Uh, prescribed fire is not necessarily a panacea. It is certainly a tool in the bag of, that uh, private landowners should consider. But we'd also like to see them consider some other options. If a, if a private landowner wanted, a landowner wanted to consider prescribed fire, how would they accomplish that? Uh, you're getting into a little bit of the, uh, the intricacies of state law. You know, when a private landowner wants to burn, certainly our uh, agency will work cooperatively with these landowners, but one of the, the things we have to explain to them is a potential liability associated with using fire on private lands. Uh, historically, most uh, prescribed fire or slash disposal fire 
was uh, done late in the fall. We had all winter for the fires to go out. Generally speaking, uh, landowners could do that with, uh, with little risk or little exposure to the risk. When we start to get into some of the prescribed fire, longer duration fires, uh, exposure to changing weather conditions, uh, a landowner may incur uh, some fire suppression, fire management problems. Uh, in the state of Oregon, we do have some liabilities that are assigned to the, purchase, to the landowner uh, if they use fire and the fire escapes their planned area. You know, it's something we would talk to them about ahead of time. Okay, so, the, so the, there is a legal problem here and a liability problem that could really right. be a, an uh, impediment. Uh, I, I would call it a, I wouldn't call it an impediment. I'd call it a, uh, something that would have to be considered in the process. You know, our, our agency has recognized what our liability laws say regarding private land burning. Uh, there is some efforts to, uh, to address these issues on private lands. There's some discussion at our staff level of how to uh, work with these landowners to minimize their exposure. Possibly some low, uh, low cost insurance, term insurance essentially while they do these burns. So, okay. so we're trying to address that. I just wanted to say that um, ODF, Oregon Department of Forestry, has been a really good cooperator and partner on our uh, Willamette Valley uh, mm -hmm. west side um, burns on Nature Conservancy lands. We've worked with you guys a lot. Great. So there's some experience here. Yeah, that we we're can learning as we go. And Jim, we, we have burned across uh, a couple of, of private pieces, small pieces, where it's been beneficial to do so. The, the thing you have to understand about fire is it doesn't respect private land boundaries. Um, everybody becomes equal once it, it starts to burn. And so where we've been able to develop partnerships with a, a cooperative landowner and develop some MOUs, and I think we may see more of that in the future so that we treat across these, these land, land ownership patterns to where we have more effect to reducing the, the, the chances of a large fire, wiping out their losses, which is what they're most okay. concerned about. Okay. Well, thanks, John. I think we'll turn now to uh, Tom Goodall. Uh, as a representative of a private company with large land holdings uh, here in the Blues, what is your policy toward wildfire? Well, Jim, uh, as land managers for a large publicly held corporation, uh, our foresters have a trust responsibility first and foremost to our shareholders, and secondarily a social responsibility uh, to the public to professionally manage our forests to protect them from catastrophic loss due to wildfire, insects, and disease. When wildfires threaten our lands, we take an aggressive, immediate action to suppress fires. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that uh, over the last decade, less than 1,000 acres of our ownership, or less than 1%, uh, has burned, with the largest fire being about 100 acres. Uh, when fires do burn on our lands, uh, generally they are low to moderate intensity fires uh, due to the way that we've managed our lands. Okay. Do you have the horsepower to fight your own fires? No, we sure don't. Uh, really, the success of, of our fire program is due in large part to the Oregon Department of Forestry, uh, our logging contractors, and I think most importantly uh, to our long-term strategy to promote and maintain forest health, uh, resiliency, and productivity. So uh, by that you mean uh, stocking density control, fuel, fuel reduction measures? That's exactly things right. Like yeah. That. yeah. Pre-commercial thinning, uh, commercial thinning, selective cutting, uh, all of these kinds of programs to promote the right kind of stand structures that uh, help to avert uh, catastrophic fire or the impacts of catastrophic fire. Uh, removing fuel ladders, removing uh, excess fuels, all of these are programs that we employ. Okay. Now, now your lands are uh, setting up there uh, north of Elgin, in, in that area there. There's a fairly, you have a fairly yeah. large track. Uh, are your lands interspersed with federal lands or with any other kind of lands that will, would allow a, a breakup of continuity? Uh, to some extent, but I think uh, to John's point, uh, our lands are, are primarily on the fringe of the federal ownership. We are our neighbors to federal lands and to other private uh, landowners. Uh, you know, part of our program is to certainly is to is to maintain our lands in a condition so that when fires adjacent fires on neighboring lands uh, approach, that uh, that basically that we can sustain minimum damage when these fires come over onto our lands. Okay. Now you mentioned that good forest health conditions uh, in your in uh, previous comment. Yeah, in the past, the low intensity fires maintain fuel at low, lever, le low levels, thus creating a situation in which fires sort of crept along the ground. 
uh, do you think that thinning and removal as a, as a method mm -hmm. uh, mimics fire in terms of its uh, eco ecosystem effects? Yeah, we've, we've been very satisfied with our program and uh, we've got a number of, of growth plots across our land that we monitor, uh, continually monitor growth, productivity, and really the dynamics that are happening on our forest lands. And, uh, you know, we're, we're very pleased with our programs. We think that, uh, that uh, our good stewardship practices and our, our practices of applying silviculture to, to avert catastrophic damage have, have paid off well for us. Okay, so in terms, you mentioned the stand growth. In terms of the, the, tr the tree vigor and uh, the, the, the speed at which they're growing, uh, uh, their productivity, right. you're, you, you feel as though your right. program is working well. The program is, is really focused on, on increasing uh, vigor and resiliency. Uh, when stands are healthy, vigorous, uh, they are more resilient uh, to insects and disease and catastrophic wildfire. Um, our program looks at, at thinning trees so that when fires do come onto our land, there is space between the crowns for the heat to escape. Uh, the fuel ladders are, are basically non-existent, these sorts of things. So that the, the fire basically stays on the ground and behaves and really is, is more beneficial. Would you generally, would you say then that, that uh, good tree health means good ecosystem health? Would you yeah. go so far as to say that? I, I think th that really is a, you know, at the heart of our, our success, that uh, you know, really, really pushing to promote um, individual tree vigor and subsequently stand health uh, you know, is, is an approach, a, a more um, ecosystem type of approach, I think, or a more diverse approach to uh, promoting overall forest health, yes. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, now I'll turn to you, finally, uh, Verde Yudi. Uh, what is the philosophy of the Nature Conservancy with respects to the, uh, the fuel issue and the wildfire issue? Well, in general, the Nature Conservancy has a let burn um, policy on our lands. And I say in general because we don't want to have catastrophic fires, and we're going to manage our lands to um, reduce catastrophic fires, and usually that means um, entering into a prescribed burn program to reduce some of those fuels. We monitor our fuels, and if we feel like we've got a, a problem, we're going to go in and um, do some prescribed fire. And in one case, um, our fuel loads are so high that we can't go into a prescribed fire program right away. Um, and so we are doing some um, thinning and removal as a first step to eventually um, uh, be able to reintroduce fire again in its natural fire frequencies. And uh, what I mean is not a stand replacement fire, but I think um, I read like 80% of the fires in the Blue Mountains used to be surface or understory burns. And that's what we'd like to have our land ready to uh, actually, if we had a wildfire, um, that it would just be, a, we could reduce the fuels to a point where it would just be a, a surface fire. But, but your, your emphasis and your, um, your uh, focus on prescribed fire, uh, that implies the philosophy of maintaining um, sort of natural uh, ecological um, um, variables right, in, your, right. in your system. Right, and natural fire frequencies. I think that the thinning and removal is fine for the overstory species, but we're not just managing for the trees. We're managing for everything out there, and a lot of those understory species need fire, like ceanothus and lupin, a lot of those seeds need fire to in order to germinate, and so we want the fire to go through so it allows you know all the species in the Blue Mountains as elsewhere have, have adapted different responses to to fire. Now, aren't, isn't Ceanothus a nitrogen fix and legumes? Mm -hmm. uh, aren't they nitrogen fixing species? So if we if we encourage them, we we build up the nitrogen levels in the yeah, soil. Yeah, and I think fire is important for nutrient nutrient cycling too. And and so we we would like to have. Uh, fires burn on our property, but we do realize that we don't want a catastrophic fire, <laughs> and so we have to manage. So your, your objectives, really, in terms of, um, of not wanting catastrophic fire, are pretty much identical to everybody else's, uh, but the means to get there is a bit different. It's more focused on ecological values. Uh, you, would yeah, you say I, that was a fair comment? I think, that, I think that's true. <laughs> okay. And n now with the thinning and removal, you mentioned this one, this one project on your, on your preserve there in the Mill Fork. I, I'm assuming that's where that is. 
um, and you would use thinning and removal to prepare for oh, prescribed fire. Right. What are you going to do with that product? Um, well, we're hoping that that, that product um, could be sold and that hopefully it would pay for uh, the thinning and removing. Um, and we kind of see it as a forest restoration project. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, were, we would hope that we could sell some of that and uh, have it pay for the, the thinning operation. So you're not adverse to the economics of it. You're just, uh, you feel as though that's not an emphasis. That's a means to an end. To a healthy forest right. is, okay. is the objective. OK. And, uh, um, if, if we can't to produce, we have to raise the money somehow, and it would be really nice if we could get a return for, for what we take out. Otherwise, we're going to have to um, work through other channels to try to raise the money in order to do the project. Okay. Um, I ask you the same question I asked Tom. Um, do you, are you able to accomplish prescribed fire here in the Blues on your own? Um, no, we don't have the infrastructure. And um, uh, as I mentioned, we've worked with ODF and the, Blue uh, and the BLM, actually, in a lot of places. On one preserve um, on the Middle Fork, we worked with the Forest Service. It was kind of, they were going to do a prescribed fire, and it crossed, it was easier for them to put their fire line kind of on our property. So they actually came to us and said, could we burn um, some of your lands? And we said, oh, yes. And then we were able to um, uh, give them some manpower as well as monitoring the results of the fire. And that worked out really well. And actually, that, that area in the prescribed fire was in the summit fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, although most of the, the uh, forest on the, on the federal land is, is toast, <laughs> <laughs> on, on our lands, we came out pretty, pretty well. And we only have about 10% of what burned was stand replacement mm -hmm. on, on our lands. And it, it was pretty much an underburn. In fact, it didn't take enough out. So you'd attribute the success that uh, of the, the lower intensity fire, you attribute that primarily to the fuel reduction? Um, well, I don't, I don't know if we can say it's totally because of the prescribed fire. Mm -hmm. it, the fire came down on us a couple days later after uh, the really intense weather conditions we had. So that it may be due to, uh, to cooler temperatures as mm -hmm. well. But I really think that it did help. Had some effect. Yeah. Let's, let's back away from your land holdings and think about the blues as a whole. Um, what is your view about letting nature take your course uh, on the big scale, allowing wildfires to burn as they will? What's your view in general about that? Um, well, I don't think that all the land needs to be managed as the Nature Conservancy would do it. Um, I think that man has needs and, uh, um, you know, we need to timber and in some places we're, we're going to have to harvest it. So um, although I'd like to see uh, fire and prescribed fire play a larger role in the blues, I'm not uh, prescribing that everybody manage their land like the Nature Conservancy does. Right. But, you, but you think that, uh, that nature should have a role in this as well as, as managers, forest well, managers? Well, I, th I think that if we had more prescribed fire and, and more uh, kind of less intense fires, we wouldn't um, be spending all this money to put out large fires and that we could actually do some better forest restoration uh, work in the blues. Okay. The point I'd like to make, though, Jim, in terms of if you think about how long human activity has been here in the Blue Mountains, you know, say for the last 80 to 100 years with early sheep grazing, cattle grazing, and, and timber harvest and eroding and homes, is that we've been a player in this ecosystem for long enough now that the option of just standing back and saying, no, we, we're not going to intercede or be part of it anymore, I'm not sure that's an option. Because of our early involvement, I think we need, need to stay connected. We may need to adjust what we're doing but we do need to stay involved with the process. Now, uh, you mentioned the 80 to 100 years. That, that's the European settlers. Correct. And European Correct. settlers came. Prior to that, the Native Americans were here, uh, and they were conducting activities that were more in accordance, perhaps, with the fire regime? Well, they certainly um, didn't need to worry about how, uh, to the same level as, as you would if you lived in a wood house, what the fire pattern may be. Um, they didn't have sawmills to worry about producing. 
Uh, they didn't have shareholders to worry about what, what may happen to the quarterly profits. So their, their effects with fire, I believe they, they at least learned how to live with fire. And, and we, right. over the last 80 years, spent an awful lot of time trying to learn how to live and exclude all fire. Right. And so we have this fuel, fuels build up in these landscape conditions now that, that don't make no action a very good alternative in most areas. Okay. Certainly in wilderness our options are different, but, but uh, in the general landscape of the blues, I think we do need to stay connected. Okay, well, John, let me just follow that up just a bit here. Uh, the, the risk factor and the fact mm -hmm. that people are living here in, in the midst of this fire regime. Uh, we, uh, we have significant uh, parts of the landscape burn periodically, and in most cases unpredictably. We have cities uh, out here, uh, uh, structures of various kinds. We have uh, developed impressive technology for dealing with uh, wildfires, for suppressing them once they get going, uh, and for reducing fuels. Uh, yet people, uh, and yet there's still a risk, yeah. and yet people still want to build homes right along the urban forest interface. Okay. Uh, how does this jive with your, what, what happens to your firefighting capabilities and priorities when people do that? Well, it, if, when a fire comes, and, and fire comes to the Blue Mountains in, in terms of episodes, uh, they come in, in, in these thunderstorms that may ignite hundreds of fires at one time in one series of storms. And so you can quickly suppress, deplete your suppression response capabilities. So we set priorities. We have to go through a priority setting phase. And, and always uh, the first priority is protection of life and property. Uh, we, can, we can always uh, regrow a new forest, but recovering life and, and to deal with property loss, someone's home, is a pretty devastating experience. And so we'll set the priorities and go to those things. Now, if our uh, suppression resources have been depleted because we're, we're being pulled off to deal with uh, private land issues, we, we got distance to private land or a home, or we may have some people uh, at risk, then we're going to have to leave other areas, the higher elevation, the places that are um, not as, as, as pose as much risk to society and to the communities as these other places. So we'll work very closely with John and the ODF, and, you know, ODF on these types of issues. Um, from my standpoint, I think that the private landowner needs to take more responsibility for their own property when they move into these environments. Understand you moved into a fire environment and that you need to take actions to protect and reduce your risk profile yourself. The, uh, the American people all pay for a federal firefighting force, and it's, it's one of the best firefighting forces in the world. And the amount of money and, and the organizational aspects of it, if you look at what, what type of organization can be in the Blue Mountains within 48 hours of, of a fire episode, it's nothing short of impressive, but it costs us a lot of money to do that. If they take their own responsibility to reduce their risk, then I think they can help us that way. Uh, if you look at an elk hunter who comes every 15 years from Chicago, and he likes to go to Catherine Creek Meadows possibly to hunt or go somewhere else, um, and we have to pull off from that to go to a local fire um, that, that's threatening someone else. Now the person from Chicago paid the same amount of money as someone from um, this local Embler Elgin area that, that paid. Uh, so it's a federal tax dollar, but we understand living in this community, we have a responsibility to these people. They're here, they're the ones who know it the most, and will help to help us uh, work on these solutions. Uh, Mr. Buckman, uh, what do you recommend to private landowners then? Do you, do you have programs that you, uh, you, you, you try to put out to, to people who uh, live in that interface? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, I would also echo John's comments there. Is, is the uh, personal responsibility needs to be taken by people that live in forest environments. You know, in the business we talk about defensible spaces around homes or dwellings out in the forest. You know, that, that phrase implies uh, someone may be there to help defend that home. Uh, in reality, when some of these episodes that John was referring to break out, uh, maybe a concept of a survivable home is, is a better concept. So with, with that, I would, I would discuss uh, you know, fuel-free areas around the home, uh, ladder fuels on trees should be limbed up, uh, clearing, you know, around, around the barn and the dwellings should be cleared up. Uh, access to these homes should be such that if we do have engines or fire apparatus that is available, that could easily get in and get out. You know, firefighter safety is, is uh, of utmost importance in these situations, so, so that has to be considered. Uh, uh, so, 
we do have programs. There are some state laws on siting new dwellings in forests. Uh, we would we welcome the opportunity mm -hmm. to talk to landowners about how they can make their homes fire safe, minimize their exposure to fire, and and we have some crews in all of our offices in Northeast Oregon that would would find time to meet with these landowners. And and then on the other question of the uh, the uh, your priorities in terms of when fires break out, what is your how does your priority uh, compare with? Uh, yeah. uh, our priorities are a little different. Uh, they are life first and forest resource second, and private property would be third. In reality, uh, that is an on-the-ground call. Uh, there are uh, some uh, lines of thought that suggest that a house, if a house caught fire, it would be just like a big slash pile catching fire. So keeping a fire out of those, uh, that abundance of fuel is also good for the fighting fire effort. OK. Thanks, John. And uh, back to you, Mr. Zamuniak. Um, the, the financial consequences of uh, increasing uh, people increasingly living in that urban forest interface, um, are, there, are they significant? Yeah, they're certainly significant that you, uh, if you don't deal with, with the landscape that surrounds your property, like John just described, you place yourself and your possessions at risk, and maybe your investment from your timber if you don't follow the, the prescriptions, the, the objectives in terms of how to deal with your fuel loading. Okay, but, but how about the, 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 um, the fire suppression costs? Well, they go up. The, the, the fire suppression costs over the past 20 years have been just uh, skyrocketing upwards. Uh, and has Congress always responded favorably? Congress has continued to fund this. Uh, I think the American people um, take care of themselves. They, they respond to a crisis. And uh, just as, as the Midwest has built a series of dikes and tried to control the flooding, the Congress has supported the firefighting organization in the West. Um, it's a very uh, well-funded organization. And I think that th what the Congress is asking now is, where do you see this thing starting to stop? It continues to go up. Um, and that's where our current uh, direction is coming from Congress and from the administration uh, and leaders on, on both, both houses of Congress is to begin some proactive treatments. What else can we do besides more air tankers, more engines? more people. And I think that that's that proactive response and why this dialogue is taking place about trying to deal with landscape fuels and to get uh, an increase of funding to be able to deal with that. So in the future, in, you'll start to see some, some real changes. Uh, the Willow Whitman just a few years ago was, was only trying to prescribe burn just a few thousand acres. In the future, uh, for instance, in 1998, we're looking at around 13,000 acres. Uh, with the same kind of influences and, and increases on the Umatilla National Forest and the Mount Huron National Forest. So that collectively the Forest Service in the Blue Mountains is, is looking at somewhere around 60,000 acres just this year. And to see where, what we can sustain, what can we do over time. And it, it, every year won't be the same. It depends on certain weather patterns. Some years we may not burn anything like 94. Uh, if it's dry enough, it, we don't have a good prescription, we're not going to burn. But the, the, the idea here is that we certainly have to start to do some things to lower the amount of money we're spending and the risk uh, to both the public and to our firefighters in terms of these wildfires. And we've learned that in 1994 when we had some fatalities. Yeah. And compare, just give me the figure of comparison of cost per acre between fire suppression and a prescribed fire, for example. Our large fire cost per acre um, has been running somewhere between $600 and $1,000 an acre to suppress a wildfire. And that, fa that just factors in the, the suppression costs, air tankers, the crews. That doesn't have anything to do with the rehabilitation costs, the long-term effects about loss of, of wildlife values or habitat values or timber values. So in our prescribed burning, is somewhere between $50 and $80 an acre. And those treatments, you have to figure how long will that be effective. And I think most of our prescribed burning will be effective somewhere between uh, 10 and 30 years in these stands. And so you, you have to amortize that, that factor in there. But it seems to be a wise investment. So it's about a tenth the cost. Right. And those are, just, okay. those are just direct costs, not to, you, you have to factor in some of the things that Berta talked about, about nutrient cycling, um, and those types of positive effects of, of using fire where it's appropriate. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah. Back to you, Mr. Buckman. Um, I'm gonna wind this up, uh, kind of a, rhetorical question here from your perspective at the ODF as a professional. Uh, what is your sense of the future in, in terms of people continuing to live as they have in the last hundred years here in the Blues? 
um, in the midst of this dynamic fire regime? As we've discussed here today, uh, you know, from a private forest land perspective, I mean, our department's going to encourage uh, managing forest stands to meet your objectives. And again, dealing with our private landowners, uh, they're going to uh, well-spaced forests, the healthy forests, are going to minimize their exposure to some of these wildfire situations. For people living in the forest, you know, what we talked about on uh, on maintaining a fire-safe home site uh, is would be the direction that those people should follow. And you think with these measures we can we can uh, deal with it pretty well. We you don't see a uh, a dark cloud looming on the horizon. I think the. Certainly the rural interface issues uh, pose a dark cloud, so to speak. As far as the forest land issues, you know, the dark cloud may have already passed. Uh, with, with the insect and disease episodes we had in the late 80s and early 90s, much of the uh, forest lands have been dealt with or managed either by default or through active management. So I, with the exception of that interface issues and people living on forest fringes, much like the edge of town here, uh, I think uh, we're, we can continue to live as we have been. Berta? Uh, same question. I hope with the administration's uh, uh, looking at prevention now and actually putting um, dollars into prescribed burning or thinning or how we're going to reduce these fields in the forest, um, that we'll be able to reduce uh, the uh, ca catastrophic fire in the blues. And people will, as I say, live here. Maybe we'll be doing a little di different um, jobs in the forest, but mm -hmm. we'll be here. Okay. <laughs> John? Well, I think that when you're dealing with forestry issues, what I would ask people is to, to try to have a longer view, that there are no quick fixes to any of this on the, on the scale of the, the federal land system out there. there it, it took us a long time to get here, and certainly, as everyone's heard, it's going to take a long time to get out of this thing in that um, if people will, will work with us and cooperate with us and, and try to understand the objectives of the work, that, that when we're burning in the spring and we're burning in the fall, that the work is just not going to be over in one year or two years or five years, and that this is a long-term project. And, but while we're continuing to work, people will come and evaluate what we're doing, tell us what they like and they don't like, and we're going to make some adjustments along the way with this whole program. But it is going to be a long-term program, and what we need to do is have enough places out there so that when we have places, fires like Summit, I can have someone like Berta say, yeah, I think that prescribed burning you did a few years ago may have had some effect. That's what we need to be able to see. Okay. And Tom? I think I'm encouraged by what I'm hearing. I, I think that the key or the foundation of what, I, what I've heard here today is that we need to take a proactive approach, a uh, proactive approach as opposed to where we've been in the past, which is a reactive approach. Um, to John's point, these forest conditions didn't happen overnight, but they keep getting more and more severe in terms of risk, in terms of stand density, and in terms of fuel loading. Uh, I think that what is needed and, and what we're clearly seeing the science indicating is that we need an aggressive active management approach uh, to avert the risk and to bring these stands into more of the historical regime that they were in uh, so that fire plays a more natural role. I think that uh, in terms of resource losses and uh, the costs of suppressing these fires, that money should be shifted over to uh, the proactive approach to avert and uh, avert catastrophes and basically to, to manage these stands so that when fire does uh, intercept um, the forest conditions, that basically that they, they play a more natural role. Okay, and you mean by methods such as pres uh, prescribed fire and mechanical thinning and yeah, removal, I, whatever we have in our toolbox? Yeah. Personally, I, I feel that, that we need to lean pretty heavy on, on fuel reduction measures before we introduce fire. Uh, looking at the conditions of, of the forests of the Blue Mountains, um, I think it's far too risky to introduce uh, prescribed fire without taking measures to make sure that they're going to burn within prescription and get the desired results. Okay. Well, thanks, Tom, and thanks to all the rest of you for coming out today. As we've seen, there are many faces of fire. As a dominant shaper of our landscape, fire is with us for the long run. It is to our benefit to continue to learn how best to live with wildfire. 
As manager of the Institute, I want to thank you for watching Living with Wildfire, one of the many educational programs put on by the Blue Mountain Natural Resources Institute. One of our goals is to serve as a neutral forum for natural resources discussion. The dialogue and the information that results helps resource managers and the public make better natural resource decisions. If you would like more information about the Institute and our products, there are several ways to get it. Sign up for our newsletter, The Natural Resource News. Visit our website where many of our research products are online. Check our video lending library for um, seminars on tape and other programs, including this one, or request one of our tech notes. Stay tuned for other thought-provoking products from the Blue Mountain Natural Resources Institute, which is a part of the Forest Service Pacific Northwest Research Station. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoyed it.